little bit more challenging is that in Rochester, with the education system um, and the unions, there's there's a, over the years I think, not just recently, has been has developed a kind of a we say a rift, a pretty serious rift between the teachers union, which is perceived sometimes as being we're only concerned about ourselves, and the population and in general, especially people of color. And you know, and, and I'm not saying because that means every single person. I'm saying there is a a divide. So perhaps the answer the question I'm asking is given the importance of unions, what direction in those kinds <coughs> of scenarios do you think that labor should be taking to kind of try to do something different? Okay. Start with the public campaign finance or campaign finance. I gave you how a few hundred people are funding Cuomo. Green Party is for a system of full public campaign finance. That's not what you're hearing from Citizen Action, Working Families, and the good government groups, because they want a partial system. They want matching funds, which we've had with presidential elections since Watergate. And, you know, it really hasn't changed anything. Now, these guys get so much money, they don't even opt into that. Um, what they were proposing for the state, they call it the New York City system, but it's not. New York City system, like running for mayor, I think it was $8 million for the primary and then $8 million for the general. Maximum you could get in public financing with a six to one match from contributions that were 175 or less. And then you could get an equal number of, uh, raise an equal amount of money, another $8 million for each race of private money outside the public system. What they're proposing for the state has no limit on their private money. So you can get a little sprinkling of public money, unlimited private money, and they're going to say we got to reform. The one percent are still going to be funding the elections, and then we're going to say we got public campaign financing. Well, the incumbents will get a little public money too. That's probably what will happen. Now, if they do pass that, I think particularly in assembly races, we can qualify, and we'll have more money than we would have, but we could still be outspent by the one percent. Um, for governor, you need to raise six hundred fifty thousand just to qualify. And uh, I don't think a third party in history has come anywhere close to that. Except for Galasano, but that was out of his own pocket. He was a billionaire. I mean, for him, running, spending $100 million on an election was like us going to dinner and a movie with a date. I mean, that's just how small it was to how much money he's got. <clears throat> so what we want is what they got in Maine and Arizona. And that is you get a certain number of $5 contributions to demonstrate support. And those $5 contributions go into the clean money fund. And then there's other appropriations of that fund. And if you qualify and opt in, you get a public grant that's sufficient to get your message out. And then you run only on that clean money, the public money, no dirty private money, the quid pro quo money, the pay to play money. And if candidates don't opt in, they go with the quid pro quo, pay to play dirty money. And you know who the clean and the dirty candidates are. And uh, that's the system they've used in Arizona and Maine, and most major party candidates opt into it because it's a pain in the butt to raise money even if you're begging for no one percent. So Arizona, I mean, isn't New York more progressive than Arizona? <laughs> there is a bill for full public financing, but it's got no attention in the state legislature. So that's what we want to do on public finance. And I've criticized, you know, the other part of that matching funds thing is the people funding the advocacy groups are George Sor no, Jonathan Soros, George's son, David Rockefeller, uh, Chris Hughes, the founder of uh, Facebook, who's got more money he knows what to do with, um, the Committee for Economic Development, which is this old line corporate rationalization uh, political action committee that goes back to World War II, and other kind of folks like that. You gotta wonder why are those really rich folks pushing this so hard? And they don't only want to do it in New York State, they want to win here and then go do the same thing for Congress. So they can basically say we took care of it. Um, so that's number one. The other thing we want to do is get a constitutional amendment. We would like the state to memorialize Congress to adopt the We the People Amendment, which was introduced by uh, Representative Nolan and Pocan up there in the Minnesota, Wisconsin area. And it, what it would say is money is property, not speech, and corporations are Creatures of the state that we give privileges to, they are not natural persons with inalienable rights in the Constitution. And that enables us to regulate corporations and to regulate elections. It gets us beyond Citizens United, beyond the McCutcheon decision that came down, beyond Buckley v. Vallejo back in 76, which established the doctrine of money as speech when they said people can spend as, if they're rich folks can spend as much as they want on their own elections. So that's campaign finance reform. Um, 
the divide between the teachers and the community, and we're talking generally white teachers and black community, that's where the tension is. Uh, and I think the teachers are, on the one hand, there's been a lot of publicity by these hedge fund people that want to privatize, that have demonized the teachers. And the black community is rightly angry that the kids are not getting educated. Um, and in some cases, some of the teachers got bad attitudes, no doubt. I think it's, you know, in Syracuse, I would say it's one third, one third, one third. One third is just putting in time. One third, doing the best they can, they're not great. One third are really good. Um, and I think most teachers that want to do good want good peers. So there's a process for removing teachers, and the, the union can do that. But when they're under attack, they want to defend themselves. Uh, now, that's one side. The other thing is the teachers need to do a better job of reaching out to the community. And that involves encouraging parent-teacher organizations. Sometimes the teachers feel so besieged, you know, the parents and the state and the administration, and they get defensive. But I think their best defense is to build allies with the community. Um, so I think that's where we got to go. And, you know, a party like the Green Party that will defend the teachers' professional autonomy, give them respect, and also say, we got a problem with racism here. We got the most segregated schools in the country, and we've done nothing about it. We don't even talk about it. We got to deal with that. We need to like open up interdistrict inter transfers, magnet schools across both regions. Start doing things like that, and then you know, so it becomes uh, their incentives for people from the suburbs to send their kids to inner city schools that got really great programs, and vice versa. They did that in Wake County in North Carolina. Um, there's a professor at Syracuse University named Gerald Grant, and he's from Syracuse. He looked at Syracuse schools, which are very segregated, and he looked at the county district. Um, you know, basically black inside the district, inside the city, white outside the city. And then they had the same thing in North Carolina, but they had a program. They had a countywide district, and they decided to integrate by class, which was a good proxy for race, not perfect. Um, and they found that all the kids did better. The poor white kids going to the middle class schools did good did better like the black kids did. And even the upper middle class kids in the good schools did better in a more diverse environment in their test scores and their academic achievement. Um, and what it, I think, comes down to is the culture of the schools. You get a lot of poor kids stressed out, hungry, you know, dealing with the streets, um, and nobody seems to be getting ahead. And then they feel like nobody, you know, they, their facilities are no good. They play, you know, sports teams go out to a nice school and they, they feel like, you know, they don't care about us. Um, all that's going into play. Um, and so you get a culture that, you know, you know, to put it bluntly, you know, you get a lot of gangbangers, everybody want to act like a gangbanger, even those that is coming from a better background. Vice versa, you get a lot of middle class drivers, or they set the tone, and you mix people up, and then everybody, you know, peer pressure is a really important thing in schools as well. So you get a different environment, and uh, you get different results. But we do know why we get low test scores. Concentrated poverty and segregated communities that are then underfunded by our distribution system in New York, which is, as I think I said, this is another UCLA Civil Rights Project study. No, this is the Rutgers Education Law Center. They did a report card on all the school districts. I don't think I said that here. And uh, on, on all the states, on how fairly they distribute state aid, New York is the seventh worst in the country. Hmm. So Cuomo says, oh, we spend, all, we spend more money than anybody else. Well, we got Harvard educations going on in Westchester and some of the wealthier Long Island communities. And then we got, like in my city, they laid off a quarter of the staff in the last four years because of this gap elimination adjustment. So, you know, and then they, now they're shutting down schools and turning them over to outside managers. We lost a high school. Uh, there's a school called Delaware. It's been through four phases of they put more money, teachers, resources, smaller class sizes, but the scores come up. Oh, the scores are up. You don't need the help. This is a community of a lot of uh, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, other Latin American immigrants, second language, um, and then other immigrant groups, Somali Bantus and people like that, Bosnians. And so they're all struggling with English to begin with, and they're poor. Um, so basically what they did the last time was not only did they withdraw the money, they said because your test went back down, you failed, your school was <coughs> closed, and uh, now the uh, vultures come in to get the public money with these charters. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw this morning, I haven't read the details, but um, Diane Ravitch, who, who's a educational historian and actually used to be in support of the, you know, the federal standards and the charters and found out the way they were implemented it was not what they said. Charters at first were supposed to be, 
schools that the teachers union actually started the first one in New York City under Shanker. And the idea was you take kids that are dropping out and try some other things in the schools and you find out what works and then bring it back into the public schools. But now, they, you know, these, these hedge fund guys find out it's a way to make money and, and it's a totally different purpose. Um, but she posted something today that found that uh, low-income minority students are scoring worse in charter schools than in public schools. And I didn't click on the link to see the whole study, but that was the summary of the results. We know that charter schools are more segregated than even public schools. We know that they push out disabled students. English is second language, so they can push their scores up. So, you know, this Eva Moskowitz touts this one school that got really high scores. But Juan Gonzalez of the Daily News, you know, studied uh, the turnover of students. And they basically, you get in there by a lottery, but if you aren't doing well, they push you out hmm. and get the next batch in the lottery. It's a game, and uh, you know, no, unfortunately, De Blasio, you know, first was going to try to do something about it, but he got attacked with a five million dollar ad campaign, negative ad campaign, and he backed off and said he, he started calling the hedge fund guys. Can we have a truce? <laughs> um, I think the difference between the you know those kind of liberals and the Greens is we'll keep fighting, and you know. They're talking about, you know, those ads, if you might have seen them or seen them in news, they, they were saying, oh, he's pushing these 194 kids out of this school in Central Harlem. Well, actually, they weren't in the school yet. He didn't push them out of anything. <laughs> Secondly, to get those kids in, you'd have to push disabled kids in particular, there are a lot of disabled at this school, out of that school to make room for the charter and the co-location. I don't think uh, de Blasio ever, you know, put, pointed that out. Some commentators did, some, you know, news analysis did, but he didn't fight back. He basically kind of was a deer in the headlights and then decided, you know, he was going to surrender. So it was long yes, this is not my question. campaign. This is our campaign. It's not about me. It's about we. So we're not saying support the campaign. We're saying join the campaign. Participate in it. And, you know, you guys know things I don't know. Uh, you know people I won't meet. I mean, there's things for all of us to do. And this is about getting the Green Party movement in a much stronger position than when we started. So somebody have their hand up? Right now, New York City is offers income. Would you like all municipalities to have that power? Yeah, one thing I've been saying, and I've been getting a lot of Republicans to like it, is we need more home rule. We need the fiscal federalism of revenue sharing, which is probably the best idea the Republicans ever had, uh, at least since the radical Republicans tried radical reconstruction. Um, and that was established by Nixon federally and Rockefeller in this state. Um, and he had to be pushed by John Lindsay, another Republican, and the Republican who was mayor of Rochester at the time. This was in the early 70s. Um, so the, the home rule thing, uh, yeah. Cities should have home rule on minimum wage. $15 an hour would be great up here. New York City is still a poverty wage. So they should be able to set a higher than state standard. And have home well, there's a, they do it in uh, Germany. What they do is if your company has to scale back because of uh, lack of demand, instead of laying off, you know, say it's 10%, you got to cut. Instead of laying off 10% of the workers, you cut everybody's hours back 10%. And then there's a public fund. That, helps, that makes up the difference. So the employer pays for the 90% and the public pays for the 10%. And then when you're 100%, you're paying into the fund. And it's, it's an old left demand of a, for a sliding scale of wages and hours. So you adjust the amount of time you're actually working to uh, the demand that's there in the market. And then um, what that does is uh, maintain employment, maintains demand from workers, you know, that they, when they spend in the market, it helps stabilize the economy, and it reduces the cost of unemployment insurance. And, you know, part of the problem, now we've got these long-term unemployed, they've lost their, their employment, and, you know, we know employers are saying, they got so many people applying for jobs, they're only going for people that are trying to switch jobs and are already employed. If you're a long-term unemployed, they just put you off to the side because they say there must be something wrong with you. And so you get in that situation, you're really in trouble, particularly if you're our age. You know, you get older and then uh, it's like, you know, you're out to pasture. And uh, so a lot of people, you know, as they're approaching 65, are just trying to hold on until they get on Medicare and Social Security. Or they got to opt into Social Security early, which, you know, you gain 8% a year on your benefit, 
every year you wait to start taking it, which, you know, I defy you to do that in the stock market consistently. Those are Bernie Madoff numbers. <laughs> so the building trades are tough. They're the most conservative part of the labor movement. But I think rank and file, and of course, we, we can put them to work full employment for the next two decades building the clean energy system. A lot more there than the fracking where they, you know, I know how the labor's union, they could show up at these demonstrations in their orange shirts. Those guys show up at the union hall trying to get hired on to some contract or some union job. And the business agent said, nah, we're going to a demonstration today. They'll pull some money out of the treasury, give them some money for the day. And they'll go down there and they won't even know what the issue is. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know that I was part of the, late, you know, the building trades for a while. That's how it's done. But that was the angle I was getting at with the, the significant number of jobs, skilled trades, manufacturing, that would be an end and should attract their attention when you compare it to the, the fracking that they're advocating for. Well, if, you know, I'm just thinking right now, you know, graphics and, and pictures, if we can, if we have a good flyer or something going on the internet where, you know, a building trades person would see that and say, oh, that's me, you're talking about me, what are they talking about? Full employment through the green industrial revolution, the third industrial revolution, building a clean energy system, every building needs to be retrofitted, every building a power plant, um, you know, that, that, that that's where the work is. They know that. I mean, I've... When you get on, talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, even the people who are officers, they know that. The problem, their mentality is a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. And if they're going to frack and we can get jobs, we're going to do that. If they're going to build a pipeline, we're going to do that. Because that's right there. I used to run into this nuclear power. We had the Clamshell Labor Committee. And we get these guys drunk in bars, you know, to get the real story of what was going on there. I remember this one time, these guys, they were sheet metal workers, they'd build a steel shed, and they said, oh, it's in the wrong place. And they moved it 10 feet and they rebuilt it again. And they said, oops, we got it. And they were just spreading out the work. So, your plans to produce some videos, for example, on the single payer healthcare for New York, explaining how it would save money, actually, how it works. Because you'd be amazed at how many people said, well, what is that? Right. And being able to show an organizational chart for the current system and what a single payer would do, look, you want to be, you want something that's efficient and effective. This is the most efficient, effective, and responsive to the people. And then you, see, you tell them, look, uh, they're always talking about how we need to level the playing field for business. We have to have a business environment. Well, the first thing that would do would put us on a level playing field with all of our international competitors. We want to stimulate small business growth. First thing that the, the biggest thing that's preventing small businesses from opening is the cost of health insurance. Yeah, we have testimony from auto parts manufacturer that moved to Canada because the health care made the difference. Mm. You know, the, the taxes they pay is cheaper than paying premiums for his employees. Mm. So he opened up in Ontario. Um, yeah, I can't draw as good as Robert Reich. You may have seen some of those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but we can do a flip chart. Maybe someone else will draw it. We've talked about that. That's definitely on our agenda. Single payer, you know, you, you know, leading up to your appearances, and you know, it helps people that aren't able to make your appearances. Right. Yep. That's something <coughs> we're trying to do. Yep. How did things go with the media in here in Rochester? And is there is there any subdivision of that of that group that you like? So I get on Channel Eight. Yeah, I I usually have I get along. Fine with almost all reporters, um, and they usually, you know, get along fine with me because I answer their questions. I treat them with respect. I treat the cameramen with respect. I don't, I don't expect them to prepare my line. I expect them to be reporters. I respect their professional time. I have good relationship with reporters. The problem is more with uh, news editors and publishers and, and the priorities they set. Now, the problem today is uh, we didn't get a good turnout because Cuomo happened to show up, the same two cities I was going. I don't know why he's following me around. I mean, I, I haven't even raised my first 10,000, you know, what's he worried about? No, it's probably a coincidence, but um, yeah, he showed up. So we got uh, WXXI and a TV station and an indie media guy here in Rochester. In uh, Buffalo, we got a indie media guy and the public radio station there, WBFO. Uh, we didn't get any TV up there. And both papers, DNC and uh, Buffalo News, did not show. Uh, and I think I treated that to Cuomo, not not us. I think you know, we just 
Yeah, it's just one of those breaks, you know. They gotta cover the governor. I mean, they can't say we're gonna cover the green rather than the governor because the governor's got too much coverage. He's the governor, not just the candidate. So, you know. What a wonderful business model. You can't afford to cover two important stories at the same time. <laughs> yeah, well, journalism, we, you know, other countries <coughs> have public subsidies for journalism. We did when we started the postal system. You know, lower postal rates for publications. It was very important to Jefferson and Payne and all those guys that we had a print media. And we were voracious readers in this country. Highest literacy in the world at that time. Uh, how far are we fallen? You know, mm. right now, a lot of people aren't following the news. Very few people read books. Uh, newspaper readership is way down. And uh, we've gone from email to Twitter. <laughs> I mean, I'll show you how bad it is. We, and I know, well, you didn't run a mayoral, where are we? We're in Rochester, I think. No. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you, Alex runs, lovely Warren won't debate him. We run no. a candidate, Stephanie Meyer won't debate him. Uh, Mayor Sheehan, now Mayor Sheehan in Albany wouldn't debate our candidate, uh, Teresa Cortello, who had been a school board member um, before she was a Democrat, before it became a Green. Uh, <coughs> What the, what the mayor did in Syracuse was say, I won't debate, but I will have a Twitter town hall. You can ask me anything you want in 180 characters or less. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens is the producer for our CBS affiliate tweets in, I've got an hour for a mayoral forum. Will you show up, mayor? And she just says in general terms, I go wear a mask and talk to everybody I can. And people start tweeting in, answer, you know, the producer's yeah. question, answer the producer's question, and she just ignored it. Oh. That's, that's what we've got. So we need to, you know, basically tell people, you, we can't take that. That's so disrespectful. You know, they, they're not taking us seriously. They don't care what we say. And that just said it right there. It's fear. Oh, yeah. They're afraid of, you know, we get in the debate and the people don't like what we got to say. No mm. doubt.